So thank you, Dr. Slavin. Thank you for ASAP for inviting me. Um, this is such an honor to be here. And I think it's so great to be educating patients and providers alike about something that I think is misunderstood by still a lot of medical providers um, and sometimes misdiagnosed. So I'm discussing Chiari and syringomyelia. Um, is surgery the only option? I mean, there's not a lot of data about this, but I just wanted to bring up some ideas uh, for possibly not doing surgery each time you see a syrinx with a Chiari. So an overview of what I'm going to speak about, um, a Chiari and syrinx in general, um, the incidence of that, the pathophysiology, meaning why do people get a syrinx when they have a Chiari malformation? What is the traditional treatment? A lot of these things you've been hearing about even today. Uh, monitoring alone, what's the evidence for that? What should you monitor and what should you not? And are there any ideas about conservative management? Any medical strategies that we can maybe use in certain patients? So I would say that this incidence is probably at the highest level of the spectrum that I've seen. I mean, the published literature, anywhere from 10 to 50% of syringomyelia coexists with Chiari malformation type 1. I'm mostly talking about type 1, um, not the other uh, Chiari um, malformations. And uh, classically, this has been taught that's an indicator for surgical intervention. There's a problem with CSF flow, and so this person needs surgery. Um, and of course, syringomyelia can be seen in non-Chiari patients as well. It can be caused by trauma, like we heard about, infection, degenerative causes, tumors, and other etiologies which obstruct the CSF flow, the same thing that the Chiari is doing. But re what really causes this CSF collection in the spinal cord for Chiari patients? I have to be honest, I'm not really sure. <laughs> We've talked a lot about the theories, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I think it could be a combination of things. And it might be different in different patients. Um, you know, like Dr. Keating was just saying, is you know, etiology. So not all Chiari is the same. Uh, so one theory is that it's the spinal fluid from the fourth ventricle, that bottom ventricle communicating with the fluid space in the central canal or the spinal cord, and that's causing the dilation and the creation of the syrinx. And it's the arterial pulsation that causes that CSF in the fourth ventricle to enter into that central canal. And then, because there's a narrow portion at the top, it kind of acts like a plug, and the spinal fluid keeps collecting there and keeps enlarging that area. And, you know, it's thought that maybe the pressure between your intracranial space and the skull and the spinal subarachnoid space, you know, the spinal fluid space outside of the cord itself, is, is different, that it's lower in that space. And then perhaps there are changes because of that that kind of sucks that spinal fluid into that syrinx. So this is one theory. And um, this is from just a case report paper, but I thought this imaging is interesting in that this is why some people might believe that this could be a contributor. You know, this theory is why syrinx exists in some patients. So this is a Chiari patient uh, that had a shunt and they did a ventriculogram. And if you look at this picture, you see obviously the contrast, it's in the ventricles, it's in the fourth ventricle, and long behold, it's communicating straight down into the syrinx. You don't really see it outside of the spinal cord. I will say there's not that much space there in that person, but um, interesting. You know, maybe this is for this patient, it's probably right. And actually, this person's shunt was broken. That's why uh, the syrinx enlarged over time. Kind of an interesting case. So other theories. Maybe the, the spinal fluid that's collecting is from the subarachnoid space. Um, and why is there more sub spinal fluid in that subarachnoid space. Perhaps there's elevated pressures in the chest and the abdomen. And because of those elevated pressures, the veins that are around the spinal cord are not draining properly. And if that's the case, if that pressure is higher, then, then fluid will start collecting because it cannot drain properly. And then in addition to this, the tonsils that are at the top are blocking the flow from the central canal, and that's why people are getting a syrinx. Um, this 
theory is thought to be one of the contributors of idiopathic intracranial hypertension of maybe, you know, in general, the thraco-abdominal pressures are causing some change in your venous pressure, preventing your normal circulation, normal flow. Just one of the theories, but. And now the, I would say this theory is becoming more popular and I think probably one of the contributors um, to the syrinx. So the, the spinal fluid is coming from the extracellular space, extracellular space in the spinal cord. Um, and the fluid, it causes the dilation and the distension over time and then creates the syrinx. Um, so the dilation uh, comes, the fluid comes from the intramedullary vessels, so the blood vessels that are within the, within the spinal cord itself. Um, and then there's a disruption of the blood cord barrier and this produces the syrinx. And I think it's important to remember those things because as we talk about possible, med possible medical therapies or conservative management, it's important to remember what's causing this in the first place. And um, I know we've talked about this, traditional treatment. Uh, so this is what people normally do, a strategy for taking care of this. So you know, we talked about that sub suboccipital craniectomy, taking the bone off. Um, some people might need a laminectomy of their upper vertebra uh, to relieve the pressure as well if, the, if your Chiari uh, extends that low. And then, you know, plus or minus the tonsils, um, coagulating the tonsils, which is the imaging on the right. And we talked already a little bit about the risks of the surgery. Um, it's, you know, this open surgery is not without risks. And perhaps if you're a patient with more minimal symptoms, or maybe if it's just found after a car accident or something like that, are these risks if someone offers you surgery that you're willing to take? I mean, of course, a clinician will talk, talk you through all of that as well. But you know, the surgical risk of opening the dura, there's a risk of meningitis. You can have a spinal fluid leak or a CSF fistula. Uh, stroke, uncommon, but it can happen anytime you open the dura, uh, causing hydrocephalus because you're changing something with the flow. Uh, spinal fluid flow, wound infection, and of course, anesthetic risks, which I think differs in different patient populations. Um, you know, in pediatrics, perhaps the rest of the body is maybe a little healthier than an older adult. Um, and you have to think about all these things when you talk about decompression. And we just talked about this, so the bone only uh, for case, uh, bone only for cases with syrinx. Um, I will say that in my practice, I lean heavily towards opening the dura for syrinx, but perhaps for smaller ones, um, you know, it's, it's probably not necessary. Um, so there are a few small series, even in adults, that have shown improvement in syrinx, syrinx in selected patients for bone only, but there's definitely not as much literature in adults uh, as compared to the pediatric population because of that uh, large series that was just presented. Um, the Reeves paper. So, you know, if you're going to do bone only, you know, there has to be an understanding if you have a syrinx that this might not work for you and you could need a reoperation. And the rates of reoperation are considered to be somewhere between 10 to 30 percent. But the length of stay and the operative time is shorter, you know, shorter, less anesthetic risks. And then controversy exists between doctors. So when you see different surgeons, you know, someone might talk you through bone only versus opening the dura, and some people might not, not even say that's an option for you, and what are the risks, because they feel like in their experience it's not gonna work for you. But then, you know, why does this happen in uh, certain people? You know, what can this teach us about how Chiari and Searings works? So this is a, just a case report. Um, spontaneous syrinx resolution and patient with Chiari malformation. We've probably all see, seen this, maybe, it, uh, maybe after trauma. I think that's a little bit more common where you see it after trauma and it resolves. Or some people that are pretty asymptomatic and you see them in your clinic and kind of follow them for some period of time and the syrinx gets better. Um, and this is not a pediatric patient, this is an adult. I think this was a 50-year-old person. Um, and you know, on the, the picture on the left, it showed that they had a syrinx. 
And actually, they were offered surgery. They talked about this in the case report. You know, they were offered surgery, um, and then they ended up moving, never had surgery, the patient, and then came back uh, to presentation and just wanted to get a checkup visit. And it shows uh, 10, I think 10 years later, that the searings had resolved, no intervention. Um, and so, you know, I mentioned there's some small series, kind of just monitoring searinxes over time in adults as well. And so uh, this one, this someone followed nine patients, nine adult patients. Um, and over that period of time, you know, eight of the patients did really well, um, you know, just were monitored with serial imaging. And then one patient had developed symptoms and needed surgery. So the patients that are being followed in this paper, they were very, you know, asymptomatic or very minimally symptomatic. These were being followed. Um, but, you know, if we're monitoring people who have very little symptoms from their Chiari with their syrinx, how often should we do it? You know, how often should we check? I don't think that there's any data that dictates how often we should do it, uh, but probably you don't want to go years and years without checking again, um, especially if you're having some mild symptoms. Um, and, you know, what are the mild symptoms that we're okay with continuing just to monitor? Maybe, you know, a little, a little headache, but would people ever be uh, monitoring a patient with swallowing difficulty? Maybe not. You know, that's something, if you, that's going to get worse, you know, that could cause serious uh, implications for your quality of life. But I think it's an interesting conversation to bring up, you know, just because you have a syrinx and you have a Chiari, it doesn't mean that everyone needs surgery. It really depends on how, how you're doing overall. Um, and yeah, this is a patient that I saw in my clinic, um, a 60-year-old woman and uh, vertigo. And she, she had benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, so it rolled over in bed, makes you dizzy, and actually got better with physical therapy, and this was her imaging on the left. Um, but, you know, really no clear uh, deficits or ma major, major concerns, you know, from her. And so this was a six-month follow-up on the right. I know it's not the exact same MRI, because people who have Chiaris, we order different sequences from the, for them. And it's interesting to see that no, this was better even in six months. No surgery, no intervention, no change in body mass because weight can be related, no real change in medication, nothing had happened. But this got better on its own. Um, and this is a follow-up Cine flow. I don't have the one before because we didn't have one. It was the first presenting MRI. But, you know, this showed some obstruction of flow on the backside in the suboccipital area. And what does that mean? You know, even though that the syrinx is gone, still having some the sine flow is not completely normal. Um, I would say that because of her overall clinical symptoms not being very severe and the syrinx being better, um, you know, this should always be correlated with the clinical findings. You know, I don't think you have to pay, if you see in the report that, you know, there's obstruct, obstruction in flow or there's abnormality in flow, you have to pay attention to the whole picture because this can be misleading. And so, you know, I just want to, the last couple of things is bring up any other options for management. Um, and, you know, like I said, not all Chiari and Syrinx patients are the same. Um, and these interventions that I'm going to talk about can't help everybody because the cause of the fourth ventricular obstruction is not uniform. And intracranial pressure can play a bigger role in some people than others for Chiari. And I think some of the things I'm going to talk about kind of talk more about those patients because that can be intervened on medically. Uh, so one of the things, one of the interventions is uh, Diamox or acetazolamide, and it's an inhibitor of this enzyme, carbonic anhydrase. Um, and because of that inhibition, it decreases CSF secretion by the choroid plexus. So you have less CSF being produced. So it lowers your intracranial pressure. Um, and is this something that can be used in patients that have a syrinx? I mean, a syrinx has CSF, so if you're lowering CSF pressure, isn't that something that could help? Now, I'll say I don't know, and I don't think anyone does, because there's not much literature about that. But it's interesting to look at what's been written about Diamox and Chiari and think a little bit more about that. So there was a series of pediatric patients that were given Diamox that have Chiari, no syrinx. Okay. 
And they were put on a trial of Diamox for a few weeks. And they were actually just trying to see if you could predict who would do better with surgery. But when they reviewed these patients, about a quarter of these patients got better even after the Diamox was stopped. Um, their improvement continued and they remained like with better symptoms, so they never required the surgery at all. So why does that happen? You know, what, what is happening there? And could you use this in Syrinx patients in some similar way? Um, there have been reports of Chiari malformation patients without Syrinx that improve uh, when you take Diamox. So you'll see case reports where people get Diamox and you know, they get a scan. Um, several months later, and then you see the Chiari has improved in size. Now, I would argue pro there is a possibility that the patient might have had some component of idiopathic intracranial hypertension, because that's how the Diamox perhaps helps the Chiari. Um, and actually, in dogs that have Chiari with syrinx, Diamox is used to help their symptoms. Now, dogs can't tell us how they're feeling, but interesting that they would improve. Okay. Um, and you know, like I mentioned, I think this is this can be an option to maybe for people who have this IIH underlying cause for their Chiari, um, but it might not help everybody. So obesity and Chiari malformation. So obesity is something that I think a lot of providers have difficulty in finding resources for patients. You know, we don't have a lot of other than nutritionists or bariatric surgery, we don't really know how else to support people. And sometimes it's not always covered by insurance, which makes it difficult. And not all Chiari patients have a weight-related contribution. So this is very specific to a group of people. Um, but we do know that symptom deterioration can be caused by weight gain. People get worse. You know, they were, they were doing fine. They gained 50 pounds over quarantine. And all of a sudden, they're doing, <laughs> they have horrible headaches, and you know, a lot of things are going wrong. And so we see this. And um, so can we intervene on that in our obese patient population? And how does that affect the syrinx? So there's a series of patients with syringomyelia uh, where they discussed this in three patients. I know not too many. But um, they talked about these three patients. One patient gained a couple of points in their BMI, developed a syrinx. Uh, you know, all, both of these more than 10 points in their BMI developed a syrinx. And then the third patient's interesting, uh, had, was obese, 45 BMI, and had a holocord syrinx, their whole cord. They underwent a Chiari decompression, uh, didn't get better, had a second operation, both time opened the dura, uh, no improvement. Um, but eventually they had a gastric bypass, and when they were monitored after that, the syrinx reduced in size. I mean, of course, there could be so many reasons, but interesting to think about. Um, and then like the case that I had shown before about the shunt, uh, in patients that have a component of hydrocephalus um, or a shunt already in place, uh, perhaps the syrinx is related to some shunt malfunction. And I know this is only applying to a small group of people, but it is important not to rule out the possibility that hydrocephalus could be contributing to some sort of syringomyelia. And I think these two things can be linked in a certain subgroup of people. Um, and I just uh, put this in there as another thing, uh, another case that I thought was interesting. In the literature, you know, you, there's something called venous sinus stenting, which we do for patients that have high elevated pressure. It's not usually done for Chiari or uh, people with syrinx, but this patient had this venous um, issue where their vein was had a stricture. They also had a Chiari, Chiari and a syrinx, and after the venous sinus stenting, um, the syrinx improved. So I think there's a relationship there, which is um, not completely clear. So anyway, in conclusion, um, I know I didn't give any you know, groundbreaking new uh, advice, but I think these are all things to think about. And surgery could be the right option for you um, if you have syrinx and symptomatic Chiari, and it is in the majority of people. But it does, it does not necessarily mean that you need surgery. And then a trial of conservative management should be considered if you're minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic. So thank you.